Guys, one of my favorite movies this year is The Sound of Metal. Uh, a powerful examination of what do you do when everything you love, everything that means something to you on the inside, is taken away from you. Well, the person with the answers in the film is a character named Joe, and that character is played by Mr. Paul Racy, who is our next guest. Paul, for his performance as Joe, is nominated for a Best Supporting Actor in the film The Sound of Metal, which received six Academy Award nominations. Guys, welcome to another episode of Film Nation. This time, The Supporting Actor with Paul Racy. All right, guys, welcome back to another class. And today we have a very special guest, Oscar nominee, Mr. Paul Racy from The Sound of Metal. Uh, Paul, thank you so much for joining our class and being here with us today. My pleasure, Chad. I'm happy to be here this morning or wherever you, it's probably afternoon where you are. It's afternoon. You're in California. It's all right. So we're glad to have you here with us. Yeah. So now, um, Paul, I'm going to throw a little movie history at you here real quick, because when I first saw The Sound of Metal, it, it had me draw a connection to a little movie history with your role. Um, in 1987, Arlie Emery was uh, brought in as a technical advisor for Stanley Kubrick's um, great film, Full Metal Jacket. Yeah. And the director said, wow, you're really good at this. I just want you to be the famous drill sergeant that is in that film, right. Uh, right. giving them an, an acting role. When I first saw The Sound of Metal, my initial gut reaction was I thought, Darius Martyr, your director, simply brought you in as a technical advisor for someone living in a halfway house, a group home. And it wasn't until I went back home and did a little research on, on the film and you guys as filmmakers that I was shocked to discover you've had a very long career in, in film and theater, um, right. which from some of the interviews I've already seen of you, you know, was a career that you said was mostly nickel quarter theater um, kind of thing. So a lot of us hadn't had really a, a huge opportunity to see you uh, in performance. But your performance of Joe is so powerful, unbelievably, that it, it really transcends acting, in, in my opinion. You become mm -hmm. this character. My question for you, Paul, is this. Um, how much of that character did you draw from your own personal experiences and how much of that character is coming from research and, and preparation? In other words, how much of Paul Racy can be found in Joe? That's a great question and a fair question too, because I have been, I mean, I studied acting for a long time in Chicago. I had a lot of uh, acting mentors, went to uh, the University of Illinois Chicago Circle campus and went through the acting program. I enjoyed it so much on, on the, the GI Bill when I got back from Vietnam that I went an extra year to get uh, some more theater under my belt. So I actually went to college five years because I, I was enjoying it so much. But how, now, so look, I've been doing this a very long time in, uh, as a stage actor, 99 seat houses. But how much of the character is uh, Paul Racy? About 99.999%. And I've said this before in interviews, uh, I must be a very specific type because I had very, very bad luck out here in Hollywood. However, when this script came along, there were so many parallels between what I've already gone through in my life, including uh, when I read the script, there was originally an Iraq war veteran. I'm a Vietnam veteran, two tours to Vietnam. So they tweaked that, changed that. When I got from, back from Vietnam, I had some very nasty habits that I picked up overseas because of, you get, can blame it on whatever you want, but things happen and you get, uh, you get pressurized and try to survive as best you can. So I had addiction problems when I got back, finally got a, got a handle on that, and then became a, uh, I, I moved to Southern California and ran a, a, a deaf ministry here. I ran an addiction ministry here. Um, I was a Roman Catholic growing up uh, as a boy in Chicago. I was an altar boy in uh, Humble Park uh, when we used to do the, uh, the mass in Latin. Adeum qui latificat juventutum meum was my very favorite line, but I don't even know what it means anymore now, but they had us spewing out this stuff. But 
um, uh, when I started studying spirituality with a few of my uh, spiritual gurus that I met here, my uh, consciousness kind of shifted and changed to one of being a, a Buddhist. So when Joe says at the end, in the last scene with Ruben, he tells him about the kingdom of God, that it's right here, and that place will never abandon you. To me as an actor, uh, it, it was just meaning, well, uh, there's this uh, unity that you have with all things, all, everything. You and I are one, we're, we're all one thing happening. It's all God, in other words, it's all spirit. And uh, the idea of praying to a God that is separate from yourself was something that I was being uncomfortable with the more that I studied it. And so honestly, um, there's that thing of, if God is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent, then God must be right where I am. So that's what Joe means when he says, mm. this is the kingdom of God. So when I read that line, I thought, not only have I had the same journey as Joe, but spiritually, I also have come to believe in the omnipresence of God. Well, one of the things that makes this role so convincing for you is the natural ability for you to communicate in American Sign Language. Uh, and you are the son of two deaf parents. Yes, um, you have worked for the LA court system for over 25 years as a sign language interpreter. Um, you are also part of a band uh, in which you use American Sign Language. Um, right. Clearly, you're an advocate for the deaf community, uh, a community that often gets neglected and overlooked by filmmakers in Hollywood. Right. Um, looking at your own personal connection, much like you did with the character of Joe, um, I, I have a, a gut reason of why this film and this role was going to be important for you. Uh, but if you don't mind, um, what do you want like, would you want my students to understand about the deaf community? And uh, what would you want them to uh, be able to get in the big picture of, of this community? And since a lot of my guys aren't going to be familiar with it at the same time of this question, do you mind also doing it in sign language just so they're familiar with it? Well, I could, but just to let you know, uh, sign language, you know, American sign language mm -hmm. is is a way different ballgame than the English language, okay? Okay. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit difficult to speak English and do sign language at the same time. I'm gonna do it anyway for this just because uh, I can and you're requesting it. But, Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Um, ASL is, has its own uh, grammar, its own syntax, its own word order. In other words, if you could think of it some way, English language goes uh, this way, this way, this way, but when you do it in ASL, you turn that sentence around. It's almost a little bit like German. So it's everything gets switched around. Um, what I what I what I'm I'm hoping that you guys would get or benefit from this is that uh, Delft culture is a different culture than your own, uh, and people, and especially right now, guys, I want you to think about what's going on in this country right now. Uh, you know. I think it's a wonderful thing when cultures intersect, that when you're forced into a position of looking at somebody that's other than yourself, and I, that could mean anything, other uh, uh, gender, other skin tone, other languages, things that are, that are foreign to you. And you know we have a tendency as human beings to group with our own. Deaf people do the same thing. They gotta be their own, because it's very insular. So, but, um, when I was a little boy in Chicago, uh, my parents were shunned. They were isolated from uh, pop culture. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though uh, the hearing world uh, doesn't think about it, doesn't care about it. But it comes off to deaf people as very isolating, as I said, and very like, um, one example is as a little boy, interpreting for my parents between the hearing man and my dad on a simple thing like a, a mortgage for a house or buying a car when there was no interpreter profession at that time. There was no uh, texting or anything that would help you communicate. Nothing. 
So they used their children. So when the hearing guy would say to me, oh, uh, young man, don't interpret this. This is just between you and I. Your father doesn't have to hear this. I would, I would get very upset. Sure. And so then I, uh, it kind of rubbed off on me. I started to uh, mistrust hearing people, just like my dad. Mm. My dad felt oppressed. He felt um, like uh, the hearing man had his hand in his pocket, always trying to take advantage of him. He never it was on equal footing. And I was trying to make sure that that happened. That's a lot of pressure for yeah. a little kid that's Absolutely. under the age of seven or six. You know? So I would just be, God, if I could just, uh, you guys are so lucky to get the education you're getting with this really great teacher here. So he's, he's exposing you to different cultures. And I don't care what it is. People are trying to get in this country for, for, for really good reasons to better their, their life. You can't imagine how hard it is. Uh, you can just look at our border on, uh, uh, with Mexico, how, how, how people are just trying to get into this beautiful country. So I, I would like to challenge you guys to expand your awareness, expand your consciousness to be inclusive and not exclusive. Mm -hmm. That's what this movie's trying to do to show you guys that really, to, I, I call it a unifier. Yeah. There's more to unify us than separates us. And I was talking about that idea of separation from God, that concept. It, it can go, take that concept anywhere. You, you're not separate from anybody, guys. You are one with everything that you are seeing in this world. Please benefit from that concept, that idea. Don't exclude anybody you will, it will enrich in your life. Did I answer the question? Because I'm getting, I feel like I'm spinning out of control, but that's all it is. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate and I, I agree with it. And I'm glad that you're talking about and, and the bringing this inclusivity uh, into your world. Um, and at the heart of the film, you know, it, it recognizes deafness as not as an obstacle to overcome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. but rather something to embrace if, if life deals you those cards right. uh, and that you can have serenity and peace uh, with that. But a, a major message that also comes from this film that was inclusive uh, comes from the halfway house that Ruben experiences that is led by you, uh, Joe, um, and under your leadership. And, and my heart actually breaks at the and when, when Ruben returns from making a huge life-changing decision, and, mm. and I can see the pain in, in, in your face, Paul, as character of Job, you know, because Ruben didn't listen to the piece that was inside him. Um, but my question then goes to this. I think what this film does is a great job is it, it shows the, the beauty of, uh, of group homes and support systems that are available out there. Uh, right. Do you think that the sound of metal will not only pave the way for a, a wider uh, understanding of death community in Hollywood, but with such a beautiful, realistic view of group homes, uh, do you think this film can also uh, bring things such as addiction and more importantly, the next step of recovery into a much better healing light? Oh, absolutely. One thing uh that deaf people have said to me about the film is uh you know the history of film with the way they portrayed deaf people has kind of been not so authentic and one thing that deaf people told me was refreshing about the movie was that they're, sh they're showing deaf addicts what a great mm -hmm. thing and you would think that the opposite well, don't show the ugly side of the deaf world but um the reason they're excited about it is because it normalizes them or humanizes them. People look at deaf people as something, again, as other. When I was a kid, they'd be like, I don't even want to go near your parents because I might catch it. That's, that was my feeling that uh, people that, that um, live in wheelchairs, blind people, you know, you have a tendency to go, whoa, I, I don't even want to go there. So they're happy that they're portrayed as addicts because it's like saying, hey, look at, they have weaknesses and successes just like normal, normal hearing people, you know, uh, 
but they're usually portrayed as the ancillary character. You meet them in the elevator, goodbye, or the comic relief. Here's a, here's a, a group of people that are just showing you, they all, deaf people always say, um, we can do anything except here. That's the only thing. So they're prone to addiction. There are also deaf lawyers and deaf accountants and deaf engineers and deaf blue collar workers. They're just like us. You, they don't have a sign on them that says D-E-A-F. They're just walking around. There's guys on my ship when I was on the uh, USS Coral Sea. All they, I was a, a hospital corpsman on the flight deck, okay? And all the mechanics on that flight deck are my age right now, 73. Uh, they're, they're all deaf now, but they don't sign. They're not culturally deaf. They're deaf because they're hearing guys like Joe who lost their hearing later in life, just as Reuben goes through. So those, there's that parallel of Reuben and Joe having, they didn't grow up signing, that happened to them. Right. And so uh, that's the thing. They, um, uh, yeah, deafness is not something you can catch. Deafness should be looked at. You know, when you, if you go up to a deaf person and make an effort to try and communicate somehow, they're thrilled. Here's a person mm -hmm. trying to communicate with me. Everybody else ignores me. Everybody else thinks I'm retarded. Every, you know, I think it was Aristotle that, that he said some stupid line about uh, deaf people. They're incapable of learning because they can't speak because they're mute. All, all these, all these misunderstandings, all these, these wrong ideas about all people with uh, handicaps. And so when you think about when my parents were, when I was a kid in Chicago in the 50s, okay? Um, they called them hearing impaired. Yeah. Now today, cut to today, deaf people today, they go, who's impaired if you can't sign? Uh, we're deaf. And, and hearing people are afraid to say, uh, is it okay if I call you uh, deaf? Well, yeah, I'm deaf. Call me that. I'm a proud deaf man or I'm a proud deaf woman. I'm not impaired. So look mm. at the difference between the 50s and then 2021, when they've been empowered right. to be whole, perfect, and complete right now. And a lot of my spiritual deaf friends will say, I'm whole, I'm perfect, and complete right now, just as God made me. So don't call me impaired. Okay. Um, now, you, you just mentioned, like, uh, some of the guys that you served on the Coral Sea with. Yeah, uh, and and you served two tours uh, of duty in Vietnam from yeah. 1969 to 1973 for the United States Navy. Yes, yes. Um, and I one of my other classes that I teach is a, a recent U.S. history class. And um, I'm, so first, what I would like to say is um, because you guys did not get it when you came home, welcome home, sailor, and thank you for your service. Um, Thanks, man. I am so sorry, but. Uh, our culture, our country was so torn uh, during the time of your service uh, that we didn't know how to say that. But uh, welcome home and thank you for what you did for us. Yeah, you know, don't make me cry now, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I preach. Thank you very much. I mean, it was a it was a rough time. I have to say, when I got home, uh, I expected something else, but I didn't get that. It was no. it was very strange. Yeah. Well, I appreciate what you did, and I know my students do. Um, Joe, your character, uh, one of the things that you identified with him is because although, you know, the script had it different, they transition it to where he is a Vietnam veteran for you. So let's say Joe and Paul are, you guys are together actually in a room and you, you meet up. What is it that you would want my students uh, to know about your guys' experience um, and, and what should they know? Because they've grown up in a society where if they see a, a guy returning home from Afghanistan or a woman returning home from Afghanistan, they go and they shake their hands because that's just how, just like how you mentioned from the 50s today for deaf communities, right, right. this is the difference that we have. So what is it that my guys need to know about your all's experiences uh, as Paul and Joe in Vietnam? Oh boy, well, hmm. I guess, uh, you know, as an older guy now, you know, you always think about your life, especially as time passes, <laughs> the faster it goes, it gets faster and faster. I, I, I do wish that I had at that time uh, more knowledge or had been more independent in my thinking rather than accepting everything that I 
was taught here. You know, you, 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 you guys, you have the right to question your teacher. Uh, you have the right to, uh, you know, to, to question. You just do. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't question. I knew I, my, my grandfather was in World War I. My father couldn't serve, but his brother, my uncle did in Korea. It was just ingrained in us at the time that you, something you had to do. Now, when I just saw the recent movie, The Chicago Seven, it just breaks my heart because that was happening when I was a young man, I was 21. And uh, all this stuff was happening in Chicago. But I went to Vietnam and I always tell this, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with you, Chad. I went to Vietnam as John Wayne in my mind. I came out as Lenny Bruce. Yep. That, won't make, that, that won't mean anything to your students here unless they research it. But right. I came, Lenny Bruce was a stand-up comic who turned into a social philosopher who started questioning the government on every, on every issue in this country, race, the war. Had I had that in, information before I just blindly accepted okay. this, uh, this duty, I might have made a different decision. And the reason I'm saying this, guys, open your minds to, to everything, even if you disagree with it at first. When I went to Vietnam, listen to this, I uh, met a young woman uh, there and uh, got to know her a little bit. We uh, dated a bit there. And uh, one night she asked me, uh, she said, why are you here? And I said, uh, shell oil, you know, I mean, and I'm here to protect my country. I, I mean, you know, I mean, I said, I told her I was here to, uh, to protect my country from communism. She answered to me, no, Paul, you're here for shell oil. Mm. That's how that went. And I thought, what? I didn't know all the levels and all the different degrees of what goes into a war, which is big business, corporations, politics, shell oil being part of it. I never thought about that. I just buy my gas in my car. This young lady who was, you know, was, I was 21 then, she was younger than me, a, a teenager in uh, the Philippine Islands. And she's telling me what the war is about. And my point about that is, look at how I blindly marched into something that I right. didn't thoroughly vet. I, I just said, I, yes, sir. And you know, there's that famous line that Lenny Bruce always used to chat about, uh, I was a good soldier, you know, talking about the Germans and what mm -hmm. they did, what they did uh, when they were exterminating the Jews. I was a good soldier. Uh, what, what could I do? Well, when I think about that, it hurts my heart because I was a good soldier. Right. And um, I did things there that I was told to do. And I was a 4.0 sailor. Right. And I just, I just hope uh, that I can live with that for the rest of my life. Well, I mean, along with you, I mean, it, a, a lot of our boys that went over and, you know, they, were, they just did what they were told to do. Uh, your country asked you to do this and, and you, you served your country. I mean, uh, and then when you came home, uh, people didn't give you the thank you for doing what your nation had asked. So no, so, not even close. Yeah. 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 So thank you for what you, what you did for our nation and, and uh, welcome home. Yeah, man. Um, my students are getting ready. They're much like you, when you were getting deployed over to Vietnam, they're right at your age at that point. Mm. Uh, they're getting ready to make their next big life journey. Uh, mm. Some are going to jump into their career as soon as they graduate. Some are going to go into the military. Some are going to go to college and then they will be in their careers. Uh, but either or, uh, whatever they're doing in this near future, they're going to be at the bottom of the level uh, where there's a lot of burnout, uh, where the self-doubt is overwhelming and overbearing. Um, right. Now, Paul, you have done a long career in theater, over 40 years here. Uh, and I would think at times there had to be the self-doubt was, oh. was just weighing so heavy on you that it would have been easier to quit, but you kept moving forward. You kept fighting. And now you're Paul Racy, Oscar nominee. Um, so my question is for you is for my students, what advice can you give them when that self-doubt is so heavy and such a weight? 
uh, and such a burden. What is it that you did to keep moving forward, to keep taking that step? And you, you didn't get that Oscar nomination right at the beginning, but now you are Paul Racy Oscar nominee. Oh man. Well, you know, uh, you, you have to, you have to, what advice, uh, you have to know thyself, know thyself, study that and be true to yourself. You're your only, that's the only way you're going to do it. You can't be a follower. Hmm. So when I uh, got back and was trying to get my head straight, I discovered uh, the acting department at the University of Illinois. You know, okay. this, uh, there was, it, it was like the theater and I, I opened the door and looked in, I saw a bunch of actors on stage talking to a chair, doing a monologue to a chair and this, the uh, professor watching, I thought to myself, oh my God, are these people crazy? You, you mean acting is a craft? It's a profession? I thought those guys on TV were just, you know, I don't know what I was thinking, but when I found that, when I found the thing that makes my soul sing, I can't mm. explain that feeling to you. But as a teacher, you probably at one point thought, this is what makes my soul say, Chad, this is why you're here. Yeah. You know, the thing that animates you within, whatever you believe that is. And I think it's God. I think it's your soul. I, I believe that I have a, an archangel sitting right over here. I believe in all that stuff. When that starts, if you can do a little bit of uh, sitting in the silence and the stillness, as Joe says, a little mm. bit of meditation, self-reflection, and catch what spirit is trying to tell you. And if you find it, if, it, if it's to be a teacher, for me, it wasn't to be a teacher. I, I went to college to be a teacher, but it was like, no, I got to do something else. So what is it? What is it, God? What is it? And I found it. I couldn't go back. And there's that spiritual saying, once you know the truth, you can't go back. You mm. can't go back. Yeah. Once you realize that black people, Hispanic people, deaf people are all the same as you, you can't go back to the old way people were trying to teach you. Racism is taught. It's taught, my friend. It's not something that you've got inside of you freshly as you're born. It's taught to you by well-meaning uncles and aunts and wherever you've grown up. And so once I knew that, I couldn't let go of it. So I would take any, I would take any role. I started out in college. I took the small uh, one line in Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Thou art a pretty piece of flesh. That one line that uh, the guy with the spear says at the beginning. And I graduated doing Mac the Knife. I just accelerated my program. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And so then you graduate from college, guys, and you get in the real world. And my acting professor told me, I had a meeting with him. I said, what's next for me? You know, he says, Paul, very wise old acting professor. He just died last year, as a matter of fact. Bill Raffeld. He said, Paul, I don't think you're going to have any success for a long time. I think, I think it's going to be not until you're an older man. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. So he told me to go to Second City where I learned improv. He, wanted, I th he thought I should get some improv under my belt. So I did. Graduated from the Second City program of improv. But I kept on going because... I am an actor. I am an actor. And I'm not going to let anybody deter me from that. Although there were many times when I said, uh, I told my agent, I, you know, I can't do this anymore. I'm disrespecting mm -hmm. myself. I can't. And then somebody offered me a little carrot. And I'm like, all right. And I'm like, uh, Al Pacino in, in Godfather 3, when, just when I get out, they pull me back in. You know? But <laughs> it, the thing is, You've, you've got to have something to rely on. And I think what you guys are learning at, at school with Chad, I've, you've got some kind of spiritual counseling that you're going through here. You're learning about religions and your own religion there. One guru prayed with me one time years ago too, not just yesterday, years ago. And the prayer was, nothing is too good to be true. And nothing, nothing is too wonderful to happen. You've mm. got to believe that for yourself. And if it's true for one person, because we are all one, then it's true for you. But wow. you can't keep denying it. You can't keep denying it. You've got to keep on going. And if you have to do another job to support your, your soul's yearning, then do that. That's what I've been doing. I've, I've been a courtroom sign language interpreter, certified in the uh, Los Angeles court system for many, many years. 
while always taking little bit parts. Oh God, I gotta take a deep breath and keep on going. Gotta take a deep breath. I'm in my seventies now. Oh my God, what, you know? Well, just the fact that I'm saying, oh my God, you know, I think God's going, yeah, Paul, what is it? What do you want, man? I'm <laughs> listening, you know? Well, you just gotta be positive and keep on moving forward to what your soul is telling you you are. Well, there you go, fellas. Uh, from Paul Racy, the the wisdom that you have on how to keep moving forward. It's 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 taking that breath, uh, taking that little moment of prayer and that little moment of silence and reflection, and just knowing that it can happen. So, and I, I'm that stillness thing, that prayer thing. Don't be discouraged if you don't get an answer. Yeah, you have to spirituality, or it is a practice. Yeah. And I don't care what realm it is. It's a practice. And for me, if I'm in the stillness, nothing happens, of course, because I'm trying to be still. Then I go about my business. And about an hour later, bam, that spirit, that God goes, hey, guess what? So just be gentle with yourself. Be easy with yourself. Love, love yourself. Okay. And that is a, that right there it is one of the biggest things that a lot of us struggle with is just being able to find uh, a way of loving ourselves. Uh, oh, we have come through our classroom uh, moments and thank you so much for, for your insight on, on the film and the craft that you do, as well as some uh, important life uh, wisdom. We're now in a little section that we like to call five quick questions. This is a quick little game that we're going to play here together. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. The way it works is I'll ask you a question and you come up with the quickest answer that, you know, best reflects Paul Racy. Are you, right. you ready to play? Uh, I'm ready. <laughs> All right. And away we go. All right. Question one, Paul, just a few moments ago, you just talked about like uh, deaf people would love for an attempt for someone to communicate with them. Right. That being said, you being the advocate for the deaf community, what is one phrase or some kind of attempt to communicate that my guys should just basic know in how to just open up that bridge of uh, some way of communicating? Well, the first thing is if, if you see somebody and there's deaf people all over. You see a deaf person up there, uh, don't ignore them. If you can go up and smile and say, hi, just go, you know, there are, we call them gestures. Hi, are you deaf? I want to communicate. So I want, I, you bring it to, I want to communicate. You can go on, you know, you can go on YouTube and you can get basic sign language. God, it's so easy to learn basic sign language on, uh, on YouTube and, and other things. You don't have to pay for lessons or something. That's, it's a great resource. Learn a few signs. I see people at Starbucks all the time. Starbucks, Starbucks, right? Coffee, coffee. You now you grind the coffee. Mm -hmm. First thing I ever learned as a, as a baby was milk. And you're milking the udder for milk. So, God, it's so, it's really not that hard. But if, um, I, would, I would recommend that. Don't be afraid of deaf people. When a, a hearing person comes up to them and makes a, an attempt, watch their face. It goes, wow. This guy was so cool. It's, they love it. They do. All right. Question two, staying on the same theme. You are the lead singer and the lead signer for Hands of Doom, uh, an ASL rock band. Now our world is opening up. Uh, eventually we're gonna be getting into live music again. What could we expect if we were at one of your concerts? Well, we're opening a club on uh, May 1st here in Southern California, Petey's uh -huh. Place, which is a heavy metal rock bar. If you come to see one of our shows, it's hilarious because we have like 30 to 40 deaf people that come in to a heavy metal rock bar. Here's these hardcore headbangers, right? And they come in and they're signing, they're rocking out, they're up at the front feeling the bass. So it's an eye opener for them because you think, well, what are deaf people doing here? It'll just let you know that there are different levels of deafness. Some people have no hearing at all. Some people have a little bit. Some people have a lot. Some are just hard of hearing. They're not a monolith, but you're going to see deaf people enjoying Black Sabbath. And Black Sabbath lyrics in sign language are prolific. It's you know, love, war, nuclear war, uh, heaven, 
hell. All these big, huge concepts that we all understand. But it, again, it unifies my deaf audience with the hearing audience. And because it's so damn loud in there, you can't hear a damn thing. Because we play Black Sabbath is, is head banging loud. I have to pass out earplugs for everybody so they don't go deaf themselves. But you see how these two cultures intersect. And I'm saying that again for a reason. These are two cultures that are just different, but they intersect and people find out, oh my God, we have more in common than, than not. All right, now Paul, I'm gonna age my students here. Um, number Question number three, they were all born pretty much after Black Sabbath was had released most of their, their of primary course. albums. Of I mean, course. they went from 1969 to 2017. Uh, since your band is a Black Sabbath tribute band, uh, if my guys would be interested in the early pioneers of heavy metal, Black Sabbath, yes. what's the one album lead singer would be their good introduction? Oh, oh and man. Why? Yeah, great question. God, well, we do music, we do cuts from the first eight albums, and those are all Ozzy. After Ozzy left, then uh, they had other lead singers. I would say get volume four. Classic, every cut. On, I, I, yeah, volume four, because there's uh, Black Sabbath, and then comes Paranoid, which is great. I can't really pick now, because I'm still going to Get volume four. Uh, okay. Tomorrow's Dream, Supernaut. Yeah, get that. But I, I will say this, guys. Um, if you like uh, metal, everything, it, it's like, what's the precursor for everything? Black Sabbath. That's the thing that everybody shoots off from, including Metallica, including anybody that's headbanging. You go right back to Black Sabbath. Not to say that I don't love the Beatles and love the Rolling Stones and all the rock bands, but Black Sabbath, that's the one that everybody else comes from. So uh, check out Volume 4. It's the one where he's got he's got the, the leather strings hanging out. He's going like this, Ozzy. That is a great, you can't go wrong with that one. You can't go wrong. Okay. Well, there you go, guys. That's your next next assignment. Uh, question number four, Paul. Um, Hollywood has not done really the best of jobs of depicting deaf, uh, the deaf community, as you already pointed out. So what is one of those, other than The Sound of Metal, what would be one of those either great acting performances by a deaf actor or a movie that did a good job, in, in your opinion, uh, of celebrating the deaf community? What's a good go-to film? There's not very many, but I will say the first thing that comes to mind it's a, it was a television show. You can find it easy, but it got a lot of Emmys. It's called Love Is Never Silent. It happened about, geez, 30 years ago. It's still a great film. It's not dated at all. It stars Ed Waterstreet, a great deaf actor. Phyllis Freelich, another one who's no longer with us, but a great deaf actor. Check out Love Is Never Silent. It's all about uh, a coda, which is what I am. I'm a child of deaf adults. That's what we call ourselves, codas. And we have an international organization where people from all over the world would get together once a year or once every two years and talk about our deaf parents. As a matter of fact, this Sunday, Oscar Sunday, is the 25th annual International Deaf Parents Day. Wow. So, uh, yeah, so that, I would say check out Love is Never Sound. You'll learn a lot about what it's like to grow up with deaf parents. That's, uh, you can't go wrong with that one. Okay. Fifth question, Paul. Now that you know what we're doing here in class, uh, who's someone that you think would be good for us to continue this conversation? Who would somebody that you would like to invite to our classroom for us? Well, for this, for this class, the director of Sound of Metal, Darius Margaret, would be fantastic because you're gonna see that he researched and worked on this movie for 14 years. So everybody thinks, wow. whatever they think about Hollywood, oh yeah, man, he traveled across the country, met with deaf leaders, deaf advocates, deaf actors, got, and his learning curve was so huge that he kind of flattened it out a little bit to the point where when we got on set, he was still had a learning curve, learning how to deal with these actors. So there's a guy who had money for the movie, then lost it. Had this all set up, then lost it. 14 years and all the way to the point of casting it had a bunch had two other stars that were supposed to star in the movie lost them 
mm. ended up with Riz Ahmed and Olivia Cook. He was told from the beginning, the way it works in Hollywood, if you want to get some money for your film, you got to get a name. And that's been my problem, you know, because no Paul, who knows Paul Racy, except for now. But, you know, it's like, uh, well, you got to get a name like Robert Duvall, like somebody, somebody that was signed on the bottom line and then somebody invests. He resisted. He mm. resisted on somebody that could be authentic, like Paul Racy. You know? So it's like, um, they, he's this guy's got <laughs> he's got nerve he's got gumption he's got balls he just went ahead and did what i was telling you guys in the beginning what his soul was calling out for him to do he listened to that inner voice he's and he's here's another guy darius martyr who's a uh, very buddhist like or very spiritual in his every move every breath so you got to think of it that way um here that would be a great guy to talk about for 14 years. And then, then he shoots the movie in six weeks and works on the sound for nine months. Wow. Yeah, so there, there's a guy that would tell you, it ain't that easy, but you can't give up on your specific dream, whatever that dream is. Well, let's hope we can make this connection. I would love to have him in class. I know we'd get a lot. I mean, The Sound of Metal is, nominated for six Oscars. And uh, Paul Racy, you have finished five quick questions. You have done an amazing job with this. I uh, passed the I audition. You, you, you aced the audition. <laughs> so I wish you good luck this coming Sunday. Um, and uh, I really, again, your, your performance, I think was brilliant and amazing. And I'm, I'm, I'm very thankful that you joined our class, and I'm very thankful to have witnessed such a powerful, powerful uh, bit of acting. So thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Chad. I wish every single one of you guys the best of luck. Just be true to yourself. I, I'm just so glad I could be here with you. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Paul, thank you so much for being a part of this class, and good luck to you this coming Sunday at the Oscars. No matter whether you win or lose, I know that the world is a better place now knowing that Paul Racy is in. And thank you, Paul, for spending a few moments of your time during your Oscar week with us. Again, good luck to you. Guys, uh, do take these conversations and look at the bigger picture of them. See what are the life lessons besides just the craft that you can apply to your life and what words of wisdom can you use to keep moving forward in your own life. As always, gentlemen, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and this time, rock on. Catch you later.